to experience, and, and uh, I'm just thankful for all that help, and I'm mindful, and it gives me a great joy to be able to serve the Lord in whatever capacity that I'm in. Amen? And would you take the Word of God, please, and turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter number 3. We've talked about coming to the Lord and saying, here am I honestly. Who are we before the Lord? Uh, what, what is it that I am before God? And then we came to the Lord openly and asking God to show us some things. Then we come here in this month of March, and we say, here am I readily. Here am I readily. And uh, I'd like to, in the next three weeks, cover here am I readily. Ready to listen, ready to learn, and ready to live. And God has been so faithful. And I trust we're ready to listen to him this morning. As he speaks to us, we were, even in our Bible study this morning in Exodus, it is Moses giving a message to, uh, uh, God giving a message to Moses, and Moses conveying that message to the people. And the people still had to respond, but they weren't responding to Moses. They were responding to God. And this morning, I'm going to be physically speaking this morning. But I'm giving you what the Word of God says. And so this morning, we must be ready to listen. And let me ask you a question. Is God still speaking today, yes or no? Yes, yes He is. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But let's, open, let's look at the uh, one verse real quick, just to get started, then we'll go backtrack through. Look at verse number 10. The story of Samuel here, and uh, Samuel being a young man at this time and following under the tutelage of, tutelage of the priest Eli. And he has this unique experience happening to him where the Lord comes to him. And he doesn't know it's the Lord at the time. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But the Lord is speaking to him. And finally, Eli realizes it's the Lord and tells him that when you hear it again, if you hear it again, respond uh, in a positive manner, if you will. And we'll read that here in verse number 10. It says, The Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Speak, for thy servant heareth. We have read in the Bible and we see in the New Testament, it says, If any man have an ear, let him hear. And you are to come this morning and I am to come this morning with hearing ears. Uh, these aren't hear ears that just hear noise or things that are going on. If that were the case, all I would hear is my tinnitus in my left ear, and I'd hear myself talking in the right ear, amen? Uh, but you're here to hear with an understanding, with a, 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 you can comprehend is what he's trying to say. It's not just hearing it, but you're listening, you're taking it in, and you're comprehending what's being said for a purpose of applying it to your life and furthering what God has called you to do. I want to begin by making that statement again, is God speaking still today? Yes, he is. Amen. He is speaking and he has spoken and he is speaking through creation today. Oh, we know this Psalm 119, or sorry, Psalm 19, sorry, verses 1 through 6 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day uttereth, uh, day uttereth speech, and night unto, uh, unto night, sorry, showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voices is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a son, strong man, sorry, to run a race. His going forth is from the end of, of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the, the heat thereof. God's heaven declare that he's still speaking today. He speaks of his power in the seasons and speaks of his timing in the days and the years speaks of his great and wonderful power. Every morning when you wake up and you see that sunrise, it is God's mighty power being displayed for you and I. So God is still speaking in through his creation. God speaks to us through the scriptures, doesn't he? He speaks to us through the scriptures. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 16 and 17, it says all scripture is given in, by inspiration of God and is profitable. That prophet, it's speaking to you. Prophet for what? For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So he's speaking to us through creation every single day. But he also speaks through a word. Now, listen, people can look at the power and the might of God in creation, but there has to be something further. The Bible doesn't say faith cometh by creation. and No, it says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's the word God that reveals to me that I am a sinner. The creation shows his power and his handiwork and all of that. But the word God reveals to me that I am a wretched, poor sinner in need of salvation. 
And it, it, it puts in that desire. Creation really just kind of wet the appetite to say there is something out there. There is somebody that created it all. There's somebody that has all this in order. And you heard a big bang behind uh, this platform. You say, what made that noise? And I would say to you, nothing. You'd be like, okay. No, you wouldn't. You'd say, I don't care what that guy said. Something made that noise. Let me tell you, something made this earth. Somebody made this world. Something is keeping this world in order. And it's not something, it's somebody, and it's Almighty God. So creation does speak, and the Word of God speaks, the Scripture speaks to us. He speaks to us, the Bible says, to preachers and teachers and evangelists. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 14, and he gave, God gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the mystery, for edifying the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, but the slight of men and the concraftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Now think about that. God is trying to speak to us through creation. There is something created, and the Word of God reveals it to us. But then, if you're like me, and when I first got saved, and even now still, I listen to preach. You know why? I say to myself, huh, how do you get that out of there? Oh, the Holy Spirit did that. But I need preaching. I need teaching. I need all those things, just like you need those things. God is trying to give us a, a, a more sure word through His Word. And He uses preachers and teachers and evangelists to do so. Why? He tells us there are some dangers out there. He said, if you have some people in your life that are, that are solid preachers, biblical preachers, and they're biblical teachers, and there are people out there evangelizing biblically, why? Because there are people always trying to push you about with every wind of doctrine. This is why we have such travesty in our world today because people don't know their Bible. They don't trust their pastors. They don't trust their teachers. But they go on YouTube to a guy they've never met, they never know, and say, this guy's the authority. That's why I believe what I believe. <laughs> Come on, that's craziness. That's craziness. Here he tells us, he gives us, God gives us things in our life that we need, preachers and teachers and evangelists. And that's how he speaks to us. He speaks to us through preachers and teachers and evangelists, through the scriptures, through creation. But also, he speaks through difficulties, doesn't he? How many of you here today have said that God has spoken to me through some difficulties? And they weren't fun. You're not like, hey, sign me up for round two, or round three, or round ten. But through those difficulties, you, God spoke to you. You think about Job, and he comes to the conclusion, he says, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Bah humbug. No. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. In Ecclesiastes, he comes to the end. He says, I've, I've come to the end, and the conclusion of the Lord matters to fear God and keep his commandments. In other words, through difficulties, we find out that God is there. Psalm 19, verse 67 and 68 says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. Thou art good, and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. You know, it takes, it takes a bit sometimes. It takes the work of God sometimes for us to get to a place as, a, as prideful men and women to say, you know, there was a time in my life where I, I went astray. I didn't listen. I didn't follow. God put in my life teachers, preachers, evangelists. I had the word of God, but I still went astray. But if you can get to that place where you say, man, I went astray, but God, you've been faithful and you've been good. Teach me your word. It's a great place to be. Amen. And some of you here have been through it in your life where you've gone away and went astray from God. But let me just say this, by the way, being that he is God, he can speak through whatever or whoever he wants. Amen, can he? God has used heathen kings to further his work. God can speak to whomever, through whomever, however he wants. Job 33, verse 14 says, For God speaketh once, yea, twice, that man perceiveth it not. And God is speaking in multiple ways and multiple fashions to try to speak. To. So God is speaking. Are we listening? Now, I want to I tell you that I remember a story of an older couple, and the husband became, now listen, husbands and wives, you can get this, you understand this. How many of you have a, if my wife was here, she'd raise her hand. How many of you have a spouse that's a little hard of hearing? How many of you have a spouse that's hard of hearing? Yeah. Well, this, this husband was frustrated because his wife was hard hearing. He says, I talked to her and she doesn't hear me. It's every time I talk to her, she's not listening. And doctor, so he, so he says, doctor, what do I do? I just, I'm getting so frustrated. He said, you know, well, you need to see how bad it is and test it. He said, what you need to do is when she's sometimes, she's not, doesn't know you're there, just call out to her and say, can, just ask her if she can hear you. He says, all right. So he gets to a place one day, his wife's in the kitchen and she's cooking. There's not a lot of ambient noise. And he thinks, okay, I'm going to try it. He gets to the edge of the door of the kitchen. He goes, can you hear me, dear? She doesn't respond. 
So he takes a couple steps towards her and says, can you hear me, dear? Nothing. So he gets up and he's now like right up on her. And he says, can you hear me, dear? He says, for the third time, I can hear you. <laughs> Oftentimes we think God doesn't hear us. And when in turn, it's we really don't hear him. Are we listening? God is speaking. He's clearly speaking through many different avenues. Are we listening to God? He's trying to speak. He wants us to hear him. The idea of listening to God must be understood in a few different ways. Is God trying to speak to you about your soul? Is God trying to speak to you about his work? Is God trying to speak to you about your service? What is he trying to speak to you about? God is speaking. Are we listening? That phrase that's found in Mark chapter 4, verse 23, having ears to hear. This is a hearing and comprehension and a position of readiness to action. And we've talked about this several times, but this, the, the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, it starts off by saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, that statement, Hear, O Israel, is take it in, but be ready to move. Be ready for action. And then he says, here's the, here's the delineating factor. He says, the Lord our God is one Lord. Just like when you come to the Ten Commandments, it says, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not know God the God before me. Uh, that statement, I am the Lord thy God, is implied for the rest of the commandments. This is why we follow him, because he is the Lord our God. I listen to him because he's my God. I follow to him because he's my God. Amen? Hello? <laughs> I do say because he's my Savior. Uh, people often don't serve God because he's not really their Savior. He's their religion. He's their ideal. We talked about in Sunday school, uh, splatter blessings. You ever heard that before? Uh, splatter blessings. You say, let's say you have a faithful wife that serves the Lord. She's saved and born again. And her heathen husband gets blessed because of her faith. But he's not saved. He's lost as a goose in a hailstorm. But he's getting blessings. Did, was uh, Potiphar's house and all that blessed because of Joseph's sake? Yes or no? Yeah. I'm pretty sure that's exactly what it says. They were blessed for Joseph's sake. And so let me just tell you that God has to speak to you individually. He's not speaking to your wife for you. Now, don't get me wrong. There are times my, my, uh, the Lord speaks to my wife and, and gives her something to say to me. That's fine. But as for your soul, you can't be saved through your wife or your children or this church. You are saved through the blood of Christ, and that's it. Amen. So I would examine my own soul and make sure that I am listening to God personally. Let me say it this way. Have you ever had somebody say, or maybe your children, or you've heard a child say this, well, so-and-so told me to. Did I say to do that? Your parent? Your authority? The answer is no. They still get in trouble? Yes, they do. We're not going to be able to go before God and say, well, for the last 20 years, my wife said I was saved because I'm a good person. But God's going to say, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, for I never knew you. So you got to listen to God for yourself. Amen. He's speaking creation, the word of God, teachers, preachers, evangelists, through trials. He's speaking. The question is, are we listening? Amen. Are we listening to his voice? And remember, remember when Elijah was having his moment in, in 1 Kings 19? And there's the, the lightnings, the winds, the earthquake, and all those things. And he says, the, the Lord's not in that. And he says, but in the still small voice. That means I've got to listen intently to the Lord's voice. Here, this is the ideal that we're getting of what's the profit or what's the benefit of those in the action, or what happens to those that don't listen? We get an idea of this in the, the story of the sower and the seed in Mark chapter 4, verses 3 through 8. It says, Oh, and behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. And some fell on stony ground. Here it had not much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit, and sprang up, and increased, and brought forth some thirty, and some sixty, and some an hundred. We have here those that the word of God is being cast out by the wayside, the stony ground, and the thorny ground. But they didn't hear it. They don't receive it. But then there's some good grounds where they do receive it. And then that receiving is still a level of hearing, because your obedience to what God is trying to say will determine your fold of return. You're listening to what God said it says. Some people listen and returns 30 fold. Some people listen a little better and it's 50. And some listen real good and it returns back 100. God is speaking. Are we listening? 
I went all the way to France to get back to Newark to say this is what we find in Samuel. In the life of Samuel, this young man who is God is going to speak to. But before we get into that, think about the other people who were in that house. That God chose to speak to Samuel, this young boy. And not Eli and not some of the other people in the house, but to Samuel. And that's a big deal. And let me just tell you this morning that when God speaks to you, it's a big deal. Amen. Whether it's through his word, through a pastor or teacher or evangelist, or through a trial, if God is trying to speak to you, it's a big deal. Listen and be ready to listen. Say to the Lord, here am I readily, and I'm ready to listen. How do we listen? There are some ways we can readily listen to God. And number one, we listen obediently. We listen obediently. Look at the opening verses of chapter 3 of 1 Samuel. It says, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at the time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim, that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. We see that, Sa that Samuel was somebody who listened obediently. You and I need to listen obedient to the Lord. All right? So we need to obediently hear. What do we obediently hear? First and foremost, I want to tell you they're hearing the precious word. And he says at this time, the word was precious in those days. There weren't any open visions. There weren't any new dreams. The, the things weren't happening as they were before. And so every time or any time you heard it, it was precious. I want to hear. Can I just tell you, by the way, how many of you in here right now have more than one Bible in your home? More than one. All right. Keep your hand up if you have more than two Bibles. More than three. Four. Five. Six. You see what I'm saying? Five, six Bibles in our home. And I just want to tell you, the word of God is precious. Now, let me tell you something. It may be at your house in some cupboard. You don't even know where it's at. It may have six inches on dust on it, but it's still precious is the word of God. Amen. Just because it's not being read by you does not mean it is not still precious. Amen. But if we treated the word of God as precious, let me tell you something. Sarah's going to have a little baby here in a little while. And I guarantee you that little baby is not going to be tucked in a corner collecting dust. I guarantee you mama's going to be staring at it, looking at it. Grandma's going to be staring at it, looking at it. We're all going to go, ooh, ah, and it's going to be so cute and all those types of things. It's precious. Amen. So is the word of God. The word of God should not be something that's tossed us to the side or we say this often. You ready? Where's my Bible? Did we see my Bible? Do you know why? It's because we got 16 of them. I can't find my Bible. I just pull up on my phone. What you going to do when you lose your phone? What are you going to do when you get arrested and you ain't got no phone? You say, what do you mean you're going to get arrested? Well, those who live God, they may suffer persecution. There may come a time in this life, hello, that just teaching and preaching the word of God or telling something about Jesus could get you arrested. We know people in this very room that have lost jobs because of their faith in Christ. You say, that's never going to happen in America. Wake up. Wake up. But he says the word of God is precious. When God speaks, it is precious. Have you heard the word of God lately? Would you go with me to, uh, to James chapter 1? James chapter 1. In James chapter 1, starting in verse number 20, I want you to think about this as we're reading in James chapter 1, starting in verse number 20, that you might read your Bible. But if you really want what God wants for your life, you need to let that Bible read you. Amen? In James chapter 1, starting in verse number 20, it says, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only. Now listen, that does not negate listening, by the way. He's saying when you hear it, this is the ideal. Hear it and do something, okay? Deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. Now think about that. We look in a mirror and this is why the word of God is to be a mirror, okay? It's supposed to examine us and tell us where we're at. Because when we look in the mirror of life, not too many of us look in the mirror and say, you are a worthless dirtbag. 
you are a sinner. No, we look in the mirror and we go, you're good enough, you're smart enough, and you know what? People like you. That's what we do. Come on. And so he says the word of God is supposed to be a mirror. Like, listen, there are some times I read the word of God and it's like, ah, like that's me. And there are other days and I'm like, oh, still not good, but a lot better than the other day, <laughs> you know? My wife often tells me, you got something in your beard. Tells me that all the time. There are some days I read the word of God and God says, you got something in your beard. You need to get it cleaned out. I'm trying to tell you this. You're walking around with broccoli in your teeth. You look like a fool. It's the broccoli is the sin in your life. And God's trying to show us, get that stuff out. It might seem small. It might not be a big deal. But you start spitting that garbage on somebody else. Somebody gets broccoli on them. They're not going to be too happy. You're spitting your sin on somebody else. But he says, but whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, the word of God, there is a law of God where God, uh, Paul talks about Ohio would not known sin were it not for the law. But then we have liberty in Christ. He says, so I'm looking at the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein. He being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So the word of God is not a book of enslavement, but a liberating piece of divine literature. It is perfectly preserved, divinely delivered, eternally established. It is a satisfyingly settled with promised profitability. Its venture will not return void. It is correct without contradiction or compromise. It is lovingly laid out. It is able to abide. It is the master's message. It's the word of God. Amen. You and I must realize that it is precious. But then we see it also not only as a precious word, but also the preserved word. Eli was a priest and his time was coming to an end. Now you look here, it says, uh, it says in verse two, and it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim, that he could not see, and ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord. You know, what I'm so thankful for, that God preserves his word. He always brings a man, he brings somebody's situation. What happened before Moses died? Who rose up as the new man? Joshua. God had a man in place ready to go before Moses died. God now, in this time when the visions were giving out, God is now taking this place and giving this now as uh, Samuel the position to carry on God's word. Let me tell you something. God preserves his word. Amen. I'm thankful today that we have a copy of God's word in the English language and God preserves it for us to read. God is making a way for his word to continue forward. God needs and desires for his work to go on and he is the one that orchestrates for it to go on. Let me just tell you something. If I die tomorrow, God's work will still go on. If you die tomorrow, God's work will still go on. The only time God's won't, work won't go on is when the trumpet sounds and it's all, well, actually, <laughs> people will get saved later on. But when it's all done, when it's all settled, that's it. When heaven, the new heaven, new earth, that's it. I'm just telling you, there's a work to be done and God will make sure that his work will go on. We are not always like that, are we? I know a guy, he designs and makes light bulbs. He makes machines that make light bulbs. It doesn't sound exciting to you, but aren't you glad that somebody did it, amen? And I asked him one day, I said, how many people, or how long would it take for me to learn what you do? He says, oh, about 40 years. I said, oh, well, how many people know how to do this? And he goes, I know of about a handful of them. And he goes, I travel all over the world. I said, well, well what happens when you die? Have you trained somebody else yet? And he said, nope, couldn't find anybody. It was a matter of fact, a friend of mine that does the same thing, he died not so long ago, and he didn't train anybody either. And there are so many times where I see companies and businesses and churches that have no plan for somebody to, to leave this world. And whatever they did or whatever they have dies with them. God's not like that. God makes sure he always has a man raised up to continue the work of God through the word of God. But not only this, but he listens obediently to obediently move. To obediently move. Look at verses 4 through 7. It says that the Lord called uh, uh, Samuel and he answered, here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I call not, lie down again. And he went and lay down and the Lord called yet again Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not my son, lie down again. 
Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. Here we find him answering, obe or listening obediently, but he's also obediently moving because he's hearing. There's this unconscious preparation. Who was Samuel responding to? Eli. He thought. In his mind, he was responding to Eli. He thought Eli was calling him. So his master, who he had respect for, he was going to him. He said, here am I. For your, he goes, I didn't say anything. Go lay down. The second time, here's somebody called to him. Who does he go to? Eli. He is obediently following this unconscious preparation. Now, can I tell you something? When I first got saved, I didn't know nothing about nothing and probably less than that about the Bible. But I have some guys in my life that I trusted. Pastor Lewis and Dave Wire, Gene Sharp. Men that I looked to. And they would expound the word of God and I'd see what the word of God said. And there were times I didn't understand it, but I trusted them. So I followed them. And let me just tell you something, by the way. Those three men that God put in my life, these are the three men that I followed when I first got saved. They're all still serving the Lord faithfully, Amen. consistently. Amen. What I'm trying to tell you is there's nothing wrong with following people as long as they're following the Lord. I know some of you have followed people and they're not serving the Lord anymore. And I'm sorry that's happened. I've been very spoiled and very blessed that every man that I've ever followed still is serving the Lord today. And I'm grateful for that. Amen. And by God's grace, I want to do that for you, to serve the Lord. When you're old, dusty, and crusty, I want you to look back and say, Pastor Lewis, or Pastor Foreman's still serving the Lord. When your kids, uh, when, you, when your baby grows up, Sarah, I want him to look back and say, man, Pastor, Pastor Rich, he's still serving the Lord. He probably should have given up a couple years ago, but he's still doing it. I can't hear him. He can barely walk, but he's still doing it. He still loves the Lord. Amen. Not for your praise, but for the honor and glory of God. Amen? Amen? It's an unconscious preparation. You have no idea who God's using in your life to try to get you where you're at. But one day it'll click, and you'll be like, wow, God used this person, that person, to get me here. Let me just tell you, this is what the Bible says. This is what we see by example. We see it in the Old Testament, and we see it in the New Testament. So do you think God puts people in places to help lead other people, yes or no? Yes. It's a clear teaching in the Bible. Unconscious preparation, but also an unhindered passion. Notice how he first responds to Eli, like kicking the feet out of the bed. He's like, he's calling for me. I'm in. I'm right here. What do you need? What? I didn't call you. Imagine how that felt. Oh, I totally thought he needed me. He goes, lays down, just drifting off. Counting sheep, literally back then? Samuel. Oh! <laughs> yes! Oh, he was excited about it. Let me tell you something. Again, there was nothing my pastor could ask me to do that wasn't the best job ever. And trust me, I got asked to do a lot of jobs. Can I tell you my first job? One of my first jobs. I got to work in junior church. I wasn't allowed to teach. They made that very clear. Rich, don't open your mouth. Just help. I got you. My first day there, I was excited. I'm like, man, I'm working in junior church. And brother, uh, uh, um, oh man, doesn't matter. You don't know him anyway. Lee Brock, there we go. Lee Brock comes up. He goes, hey, brother, I need your help. Okay, what do you need? What do you, I'm in the game. He says, uh, um, a kid pooped his pants on the pew. I need you to clean it up. Hey, man. So my first job in junior church, I got to clean somebody's poop up on a wooden pew. But it was for the Lord. I mean, I know that doesn't sound glamorous to you, but I'm still here. It was for the Lord. That way it was not a distraction to everybody else. Of course, nobody sat in that pew for like three weeks, but that's the first thing I got to do. Ministry isn't always glamorous. You you're expect every time the pastor come up to you and say, hey, I want you to teach a class. I want you to lead a Bible study. Sometimes he's going to come to you and say, hey, I got some poop I need you to handle. And you're not going to think it's glamorous, but Everything you do, do heartily as unto the Lord. Amen. Samuel had an unhindered passion for doing it for the Lord. His passion comes from the delight he has in service. So do we listen obediently? Do we listen, secondly, appreciatively? Do we listen appreciatively? Uh, I see in this uh, that Samuel appreciated the calling. And it's shown in his patience. Shown in his patience. Here it is now three times. He's come and said, I'm right here. He goes, not me. But then the third time he says, now go back. And if you hear it again, 
This is how I want you to respond. In other words, <laughs> in other words, Sam was like, fourth time's a charm. And the Bible gives us some assurance on this, that the Bible says in Isaiah 40, verse 31, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. We need to be taught to wait on the Lord and be patient on the Lord. We need to listen appreciatively to the Lord. Appreciate the fact that he, spe- he might not be speaking to us right in this moment. He might not speak to us tomorrow. He may not give us some grand revelation this month. But just wait on the Lord and allow him to speak to you and lead you and listen appreciatively. Now, not only did he show patience, but it's shown in the potential. I want you to notice what he says here, uh, starting in verse number eight. Uh, he says, And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall, uh, shall be, look at this, if he call thee. He was listening with great appreciation, and it's shown not only in his patience, but in the potential. In other words, you don't know when God is going to speak to you or if he will at all. But the thought that God could speak to me and that God would even speak to me should make us appreciative that God cares about our life. I listen, when I read my Bible, you know what I read? I want to read my Bible as if God is going to speak to me because he may. If we come to our Bible and say, well, I got to read it because pastor's going to ask me this week if I did my Bible reading and I got to be able to say yes. And there's a measure of that's okay, I guess. We'll hold each other accountable. But I want to read this Bible because I want God to speak to me. I don't know what he's going to say, but I want to know what he's going to say. I want him to reveal some things to me. There are times where I'm listening to my Bible when I'm at my shop, and that can get dangerous sometimes, you know? You're trying to cut some wood, and God gives you something while you're cutting wood. You don't want to pause in the middle of that, you know? You can come back and be like, hi, guys, you know? You don't want that. But there are times that God speaks to you through his word, and it could be, what if he does it today? Can I tell you that there is joy in the if? There's joy in the if. The possibility of what could be. What could God do with somebody like me? What could God do with somebody like you? There's joy in the what if. I never would have ever thought in a million years this is what I'd be doing with my life. I thought I was going to be building guardrail the rest of my life. But God had a better plan. If you had asked me in high school if this is what I was going to be doing, I went to school with Carrie, and I'm sure she could tell you some stories. Please don't. I found out today that my friend Jason has been coming to church here. He's, he's uh, uh, Paul's uh, uh, lab tech for his treatments he's getting. That's dangerous. They got lots of time to talk. And they still get a chuckle about what I do with my life. And it's not a choice I've made, though I love it. God could do something. There's joy in the if. What if? What can God show you? What can God bring you? Oh, the great joy that's found in the what if. You know, I often say, I hear told by a a wise man that I believe that God is keeping me around just to be an encouragement and help to you. What if that's you? What if God wants to use you and keeping you around here and keeping you in this world just to be an encouragement to somebody else? What a joy that is just to do that. But not only that, but it's shown in his persistence. Again, Samuel takes the instruction of Eli, his spiritual leader, and he goes back and he waits to see if God's going to talk to him, and he does. Let me just ask a question. What would have happened if the children of Israel stopped on day six, walking around the walls of Jericho? What do you think would have happened if Naaman dipped six times in the water instead of seven? There are often times we think, and ask yourself this question, what would have happened if you would have quit on God the week before you got saved? There's joy in the if. It's seen in his persistence that he is appreciative of what God is speaking and he wants to listen to him. But he's also appreciative of the conflict. Look at verses 11 through 15. It says, And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both the ears of every one that heareth it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house when I begin. I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. Now I want you to think about this. This was not fun. Again, 
Sometimes when God speaks to you, it's not always lollipops and gummy bears. It's not always made in the shade with pink lemonade. Sometimes it's not so fun. And here is Eli, I'm sorry, here is Samuel getting this message. But he's appreciative even of the conflict that God would give this opportunity to it. He shares with him this extensive work. He tells them here that, that uh, he has a message to give to them. And he says that I will do a thing in Israel. This is a very extensive work that God is going to carry out. And let me just tell you that we are reminded of the power of God's word in Hebrews chapter 4 in verse 12. It says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. The joints and marrow and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intent of the heart. God's word is powerful. And sometimes it pierces. Sometimes it breaks. And in this case, God is giving a message that's an extensive work, but also it's an excruciating work. The man that he looked up to the man he was following, now God is giving him a message to give to him. Imagine that. Could you imagine that? Having to deliver this message to the man you're following and saying, man, because, and it's interesting too that you notice in the scriptures, what does he say? He says, because your sons are vile and you didn't restrain them. Can I just tell you there's great responsibility in being a parent? If you are just letting your kids do whatever they want, the Bible says that, shows me here that we're going to face some judgment for that. Letting them, we didn't restrain them. We didn't do, I'm not just, I'm not saying lock them in a cage, not lock them in a room. They still have to have the choice. They used to have to train them in those types of things. But no is not a cut word when our kids are growing up. They need to hear it. They need structure, they need discipline. Here is Eli who's going to face judgment of God. He says, because your sons are vile and you did nothing about it. It is a big deal. It's an excruciating work. These are the things that we want to be like the, the, uh, they did in the New Testament. Whenever they heard the speaking of Jesus, they covered their ears, la, 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 like a little five-year-old. But no, we need to take the good and take the bad. If God's trying to speak to us, it's only for our good, even if it's something raw and, and hard to hear. It's because God wants us to grow. He wants to help us. Sometimes he wants to prevent us from getting to something way worse that could be there if we followed in the track we're on. But then we see that he also not only listened appreciatively and obediently, but he also listened dependently. This hard saying that, that God was being to him, he was going to have to tell Eli this. And I don't know if you've ever had to deliver a hard message to somebody before, but I'm just telling you right now, my prayer is always, Lord, give me strength. Please give me strength and wisdom to give the words that you want. This is such a hard and sensitive subject what do I say? What do I not say? But I've got to do it. So he depended on him for wisdom. Look at verses 16 and 17. It said, then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he answered, here am I. Now I bet you that here am I was with a little less vigor than the first one. How do I know this? I believe it's by what Eli says in this next verse that tells us that Samuel's countenance probably wasn't as perky as it was before. Is that, what is this thing that the Lord has said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. Have you ever been talking to somebody and they want to tell you something, but you can tell they ain't telling you at all? The body language is shifty. It's, it's different. And that's what he's noticing here. You don't just call somebody out like that. If it was for, like he said, hey, Samuel, yeah, what do you need? Now listen, make sure you tell me it all. No, I'm sure there was some visible countenance difference when he said, hey, Samuel, yeah, yeah I'm here, present. Yeah. And he says, I pray thee, hide it not from me. God do so to thee and more also, if thou hide anything from me of all the things that he said unto thee. He depended on God for wisdom. I want you to notice something, by the way. What did it say about Eli's eyes at the very beginning? They are waxing dim. But I just want to tell you that there's no amount of waxing that can cloud your eyes when God is speaking. He couldn't see very well, but he saw the countenance and something was different about Samuel. I remember years ago, I was listening to a preacher one time and he was talking about, he was just starting out, him and his wife, they didn't have any kids yet. And he was going into uh, um, 
he was in evangelism, but he was praying about the next step, and he knew God was leaving, leading him to be a pastor, but he hadn't had a call yet. And he got a call from his church down in Georgia, and he went there. And, you know, at this time, they lived in a single-wide trailer, and old pecan tree was right above their trailer. So all night long, it was like pecans hitting the thing. And it was just an old, run-down trailer. And, and they go to this church, and when they get there, they have this parsonage. He said the parsonage was so huge. It had a, it had a, a bathtub that was so big. It said, lifeguard not on duty, bathe at your own risk. You know, it was a beautiful home, and they loved the church. And at the end of the service, he said, Pastor, he said, we really would like to have you be our pastor. He goes, I want you to go home and pray about that. He goes, you pray, and I'll pack, amen. And uh, he got in the car, and they was heading home, and he said he, his wife was sleeping in the seat, and he was listening to the McCamies, the God on the mountain is the God in the valley. And he said at that time, he said, the Holy Spirit started speaking to him, saying, you're not going back. He goes, so I did what every spiritual man did. is I turned the radio up a little louder. And he goes, it's amazing that no matter how loud that music is, you can't drown out the Holy Spirit. And he said, don't go back. And I'm driving, and he says, I'm thinking, how am I going to tell my wife? We love that church. We already started bonding with those people. How am I going to tell her? And they get to the gas station, and she wakes up. He goes, honey, I need to tell you something. She goes, I know we're not going back, are we? He goes, no, we're not. See, when God speaks, we need to depend on him for wisdom. We need to listen dependently to him and listen to the Holy Spirit. But not only that, but depending on him for grace. Look what it says in the beginning of verse 18. And Samuel told him every wit and hid nothing from him. You know, God is going to speak to you and he's going to give you some things to say. You need to say them and be obedient lest the worst thing happen to you. But when you say them, he's going to give you the grace to say them, to give you the words to say in a proper manner. Sometimes those words are going to be very straight to the point. And that's what God wants. Sometimes those words are going to be a little more seasoned with some salt, a little gentler. You know why? Because you may not know what people are going through, but he does. He knows where their heart's at. He knows if they're bitter. He knows all those things. He knows how badly they're hurt. And so we need to listen independently for God's wisdom and God's grace. But then lastly, listen confidently. Listen confidently. Now, remember, we're saying all these things with the idea that listening is action, all right? It's not just hearing with our ears, but taking it for action. So you listen confidently. Look at the last portion of verse 18. It says, and he said, it is the Lord let him do what seemeth him good. It's the Lord. His confidence was in the Lord's message. Do you know, there are times that, uh, that any preacher stands up behind the pulpit and they say, Lord, is this what you want? You know, imagine how Jeremiah felt. It, this, this is what, yeah, this is what you, okay, that's what you want. Okay, all right. But we know this confidence that this is what God wants me to say and this is what's going to be said. He was confident in the Lord's message. But not only that, because he followed God in that simple step of obedience, God, we see now, nextly, is the confidence in the Lord's maturing. Look what it says later on in verse 19 through 21. It says, And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. Let me tell you something. When you find yourself listening obediently, listening appreciatively, listening dependently, you're going to see God grow you as you have confidence in the Lord. He is going to grow you. It says that he grew, and it says that none of his words. Imagine that you walk with God and trust in God to where the things you said were impacting people's lives. That's a faithful walk with the Lord. But it begins with listening, listening confidently to the Lord's message. He grew Samuel in the word. And because he grew Samuel in the word, he gave Samuel the word. The more I grow in the Lord, the more confident I have, more confident I have to speak for the Lord. Does that make sense? When I first got saved, I would, I would write out like 20, 30 pages for my messages. And I'd write it out verbatim. And I would sit there on my forklift and I'd preach them three and four times. And there'd be lots of times that I would be preaching on my forklift. Listen, my fork would get saved. It got saved 10 years ago, right? Uh, but I would be preaching and I'd be saying something and I'd stop and go, whoop, that's not right. Because you get all carried away and want to say things, whatever. But the more you grow in the Lord, the more confidence you can have as you speak about the Lord. And this is what he says. The things he gave him, the words he said, nothing fell to the ground. It wasn't worthless. It wasn't cast to the side. It was profitable. I want us to see what listening to God can do in our life. We need to say, here am I, Lord. And maybe God's trying to speak to you. You might be laying in the bed of your life and God's saying, hey. And we go, mm, five more minutes. Not today. Do you not see how cold it is out there, Lord? I don't know. We need to be, say, here am I readily. And it begins by being ready to listen. Ready to listen to what God has to say to you in your life. Some of us aren't ready to listen because we're genuinely afraid of what he's going to say. I want you to be a preacher. I want you to go to Bible college. I want you to do this. I want you to do that. I want you to go there. 
a friend of mine right now is selling his home and he's looking to move down to West Virginia. And he said, I'm trusting the Lord. He goes, but if I'm being honest, I'm scared. I've never done anything like this in my life. I'm 50 years old and I'm selling my house and leaving a job for a place that has no industry. But I know it's what God wants me to do. How do you do something like that? Listening to the Lord, having confidence in him that he which hath begun to work, work in you will perform it. Are you listening to the Lord? Are you listening for the Lord? When you're listening, listen obediently, listen appreciatively, listen dependently, and listen confidently to the Lord and see the joy of the if, what God could do in your life if he chooses.